Hi, this is the lecture on space-time diagrams. So far in our discussion of special relativity, you have seen space-time diagrams. I've drawn them a couple times. The purpose of this lecture is to collect in one place all the salient points about space-time diagrams and also demonstrate its use with one or two examples. So this is the aspect of space-time diagram that you have seen. You have an axis representing time and position dimensions. I usually label time dimension as a CT to indicate that both axes are in the same unit and that both the dimensions are comparable to each other. As you look at these space-time diagrams, if these remind you of motion graphs that you have seen before, then I want to encourage that because really this diagram is not really new. What's new here is how we use these diagrams to clarify concepts and precisely and clearly specify the special relativistic situation that we discuss. Let me give you a quick reminder of what motion graphs look like. Here in this uh, simulation, I have two objects. One object has some um, initial velocity and I set up a plotting thing to plot the position of this box as it moves across. This is motion graph. And you have seen this earlier in your earlier physics classes. The only difference between these motion graphs that you have seen and the space-time diagram that you will see are how the axes are labeled. In the motion graph, we are interested in, in quantities like position, velocity, and acceleration, and we, we plot them on the y-axis. And time is represented as an independent variable. What will change with space-time diagrams is that time and position are placed on an equal footing. And traditionally, although we don't have to, but traditionally, we plot time on the y-axis. So again, if you want to think of space-time diagrams like motion graphs, that's great. Let me demonstrate an example of use of space-time diagram. Let me sketch a picture first. Let's say we have a train that's uh, moving in the positive x direction at some speed v. And we'll say this v is comparable to speed of light c. We have the train station, and everything is set up so that at time equals zero, the train's uh, back end is at x equals zero. We can illustrate this setup on the space-time diagram this way. Let me call the back of the train 1 and the front of the train 2. Then this point can be illustrated on the space-time diagram 1 and 2. And we also have a point at the station. This point on the station here, let me call that 3. And uh, let's just pick a point on the station that matches the front of the train at this moment in time. Let me call that 4. On this uh, space-time diagram, we can illustrate the trajectory of these points. These are set of space and time coordinates occupied this particular body at all times. So starting from time equals 0, I could uh, diagram these set of points that are occupied by the back of the train. Again, as a reminder, the train is moving at a relativistic speed. And the front of the train follows a similar line. We call these lines world lines. I guess we give it a different name than trajectory because um, usually when you think about trajectory, you are thinking of a path traced out by an object in space, and often we forget about the time information. But on space-time diagram, the time information is very important. 
In fact, we have chosen to illustrate only one dimension, x, so that we can diagram the time dimension on our two-dimensional plane. We can draw similar word lines for the station points as well. And when we do, you will see that they are just vertical lines. So what does the diagram illustrate? Is the fact that points 3 and 4 remain where they are in the... Oh, I guess I should have said that this is the reference frame of the station. And in the station frame, these two points remain at rest. They remain at the same point for all time. And this uh, extends to negative time as well. And the uh, points on the train, they change as time passes. So at some later time, you see that the position coordinates of both 1 and 2 are more positive than they were before. And using these space-time diagrams, it is possible to describe more complicated interactions. So for example, in the case of motion graphs, I could plot the position of the incoming object and the position of the stationary object. And when you plot them both, as they collide, you see something interesting. Something that I think you are already familiar with. Uh, and I set up the parameters of these objects so that they wouldn't bounce from each other. You can imagine these two plots being superimposed to each other and how the position of the stationary block was something like here, horizontal line, until it collided and then they are moving together. So we could do all that and there may be situations where it's useful to do that with a space-time diagram. But in most uh, applicational space-time diagram you will see in this class, you will see straight lines or lines that I can draw as straight as possible. Okay, so that's uh, enough of an introduction. The real utility of space-time diagram comes in illustration of Lorentz transformation and consequences of Lorentz transformation. So let me first remind you what Lorentz transformation is. It describes how time and space coordinates change with the change of inertial reference frame. I'm going to use two very common variables that are used to write down Lorentz transformation. One is speed as a unit of speed of light. So whenever I write down beta, it means V over C. So I'm writing down speed as a fraction of speed of light. And the other is the Lorentz factor, gamma, which I will write in terms of beta. So it's 1 over square root of 1 minus beta squared. With these two parameters, we can write down Lorentz transformation very compactly. Ct prime is equal to gamma, Ct minus beta x. x prime is equal to gamma, x minus beta Ct. In this particular case where the motion is only along the x direction, y and z coordinates do not change. Let me try describing here one other reference frame that can be related to the station frame. Oh, uh, let me color code this a little bit better so that I can separate things out. Okay, now everything associated with the station frame is in black color. And I'm going to attach a new coordinate axis to this back of the train. And that'll define my new x prime axis, which is at zero at the back of the train. Now, as you look at all these points that represents the location of the back of the train, I hope you notice that all those points have value of x prime equal to zero. And those are the set of points that will define my new ct prime axis. Please take a moment to think of this through. The ct axis was the set of points where the coordinate x was zero for all time. And in a similar way, the ct prime axis is the set of points where coordinate x prime is equal to zero.
Okay, that's a simple enough. Now, my coordinate axis has a time and space coordinate. So, what do you think the x prime axis will look like? Here's one consideration that can help us specify the new x prime axis. We can look at the x axis. When you look at the points that make up the x axis, all these are points where time coordinate ct is equal to zero. So if we can find a set of points where the time coordinate ct prime is equal to zero, we'll have found the x prime axis. Now, before you go thinking, aren't these two the same? Let me caution you that you should take a look at the Lorentz transformation at x equals zero, sure, if t is equal to zero, t prime will be equal to zero. But at any other value of x, t being zero doesn't mean that t prime is equal to zero. So let's go through a quick mathematical derivation here. I want to find a set of points where ct prime is equal to zero. So let me take this expression here and set it equal to zero. I can uh, divide both the sides by gamma to cancel that out. Then I have ct minus beta x is equal to zero. Um, let me solve this for ct. Since my uh, graph is a ct along the y-axis. So ct is equal to beta x. This is an equation that defines a line on this graph. It basically says y is equal to beta x. It's describing a line with a slope beta. I think it's easier to see what that looks like. If I first draw a line with a slope 1, that would represent the world line of something that's moving at the speed of light. So this dotted line represents how quickly light moves. And beta, being a fraction of speed of light, it'll be less than that. So for the line represented by ct equals beta x, I need to draw a line that's lower. And in fact, if you consider what the world line of the back of the train represents, the set of points defined by this expression will look like this. It kind of looks symmetric. The slope of x prime axis is beta, and the slope of a ct prime axis is 1 over beta. And graphically, these two angles end up being the same. Okay, I'll save that for the geometry of space-time lecture. So now, these the green axis that I've drawn, they represent the train frame. There is an already interesting feature to point out that I think you can see from a careful consideration of the drawing that I have already drawn. So think back to how we describe the point 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, we can talk about space-time event. Event is a simply a term that we use to describe a particular point, for example, this one, in our space-time diagram. So you could call this the event of the front of the train crossing this point labeled as number four on the station. Now, this event happens at t equals zero. That's how we defined it. And this uh, crossing event happened at the same time as the crossing of the back of the train with the point three. Now, I want you to consider that same event in the train frame. In the train frame, the back of the train still crossed the point 3 at t prime equals 0. That's how it was set up. And now, all the set of points that have t prime equal to 0 are these axis points. 
which means this event of number two crossing number four that didn't happen at ct prime equals zero in fact considering the arrangement it looks like it happened for some time value less than zero so in the train frame the front of the train crosses this point before the back of the train does if this sounds weird to you i want you to think back to when we said simultaneity is relative that is what this space-time diagram is illustrating that these two events which happened simultaneously in the station frame they do not occur simultaneously in the train frame okay let me wrap up with uh, two more examples okay let me move uh, some of the things around so that i have this space for drawing for my examples so this uh, first example is the same situation that we used to introduce the relativity of simultaneity so let's say that we have a light bulb that's placed in the middle of the train and we pick a moment let's say t equals zero for this light bulb to go off then the light propagates in all directions at speed c and we gave a description of that before without use of space-time diagram so this time let's give that description with the use of space-time diagram this is the space-time event where the light bulb goes off so i need to draw the world line of the light there's the light that travels towards the front of the train note that i'm trying to draw it parallel to this light world line that i've drawn before and there's the light that travels towards the back of the train and this time i'm trying to draw it perpendicular to the light world line i've drawn before and these are the events where the light reaches the back of the train and the event where the light reaches the front of the train and you can see here that these do not occur at the same time and what's important to hear is that these do not occur at the same time in the station frame their CT coordinates are different. Now, if I want to read off their train frame coordinate, their CT prime coordinate, these horizontal dotted lines I have drawn, I can't use those. Those dotted lines represent points where T is constant, not necessarily CT prime. To find the set of points where CT prime is constant, I need to find the points that are parallel to the x prime axis so let me start from here and try to draw a line that's a parallel to my x prime axis it looks something like that so these two points have the same ct prime coordinate the arrival of the light at the front of the train and the back of the train they occur simultaneously Okay, let's uh, wrap up with uh, one more example, one that you haven't seen before. Let me get rid of the drawings for the example we just did. Let's try to get a pair of events that are simultaneous in the station frame. I think I can do it this way. I'm going to install light bulbs on the back of the train and on the front of the train. Now, these light bulbs are triggered in a special way. They will be triggered when they detect that this point of the train is crossing this point of the station for light number one. And the light at the front of the train will be triggered when they detect that uh, they are crossing this point of the station. I'm making use of the earlier setup that I have already made, which is that these two events happen simultaneously in the station frame 
And as you will see when we look at some of the special relativity paradoxes later, this actually takes quite a bit of uh, setting up. So um, for the moment, I won't go into that detailed setup and just to say that this uh, point number four has been specially chosen to ensure that the crossing here will happen simultaneously with the crossing of the back of the train. It, we did the multiple runs and just made sure that that happens. And we want to look at the light that comes from these two light bulbs from the perspective of two observers, Alice and Bob. Alice is at the midpoint of the train. Bob is at the midpoint of the points number three and four on the train station. I can even draw the world lines of Alice and Bob. Alice would be at a midpoint of the train, somewhere here, traveling along a world line that's a parallel to the front and the back of the train. Bob would be standing at the midpoint between points number three and four and stay there for all time. So his world line would look like a vertical line on our space-time diagram. And the way to set up, it should happen that the crossing of Alice's and Bob's world line also happens at time equals zero. That's the only way the setup makes sense. Okay, let me draw the world lines of light that emanate from point one. Oh, that's just gonna be along this uh, light world line that I've already drawn and the light from two. That should be perpendicular to the world line of light from one. Now, this is what happens. Bob, who is traveling along this world line, sees both light from one and two arrive at him simultaneously and will conclude that one and two occurred simultaneously. And indeed they did. They both happened at t equals zero, simultaneous in the station frame. Now Alice, who is traveling along this world line, will see it differently. She sees the light from two before, that would be at this event here, and then at a later point, she sees light from one, that would be this event here. So she concludes that the light from the front of the train flashed before, the light from the back of the train did. And in fact, if you draw the line of simultaneity, line that is parallel to the x prime axis that goes through the point two, this is below the x prime axis, meaning that the value of time here, or t prime value, is less than zero. The light bulb at the front of the train did flash before the light at the back of the train, in the train frame. This example of relativity of simultaneity is the example that your textbook uses. And I hope you see how with the use of space-time diagrams, these consequences of special relativity become much more clearly illustrated. And the value of a space-time diagram is really twofold. One is in when you learn how to correctly draw the Lorentz boosted axis, you are basically illustrating Lorentz transformation in a graphical form. And the second value is when we describe events and sequence of events in words, there is a tendency for people to assume simultaneity implicitly without explicitly saying so. The space-time diagram by geometric arrangement clearly illustrates when you have assumed some events to be simultaneous in a particular reference frame and when you didn't. And by explicitly incorporating this uh, relativity of simultaneity, it helps us avoid conceptual errors. So that's uh, everything I wanted to talk about with the space-time diagram with the two examples that I hoped would illustrate its usefulness. And you will see this tool being used 
continuously as we work through applications of Lorentz transformation and especially the special relativity paradoxes. Thank you and see you next time.